All right, good afternoon. Welcome to our 215 session. This is Supply Chain Risk Management, which will be given by Stacia Karen, Terry Kelly, Morgan King, and Tom Williams. So I'll turn the time over to you, Tom. Thanks, Maylee. Good afternoon, everyone. We really appreciate you joining us today. And welcome to this presentation on supply chain risk management and the differentiated audit experience. Here's the plan for today. Morgan and I will, will start with some introductory information. We'll turn it over to Stacia and Terry for the audit portion with our same two entities that we've been reviewing today, Orco and Sunbear. And then I will close with some key takeaways. Managing risks to supply chain is an important component of your overall posture of cyber and physical security. With increasing reliance on third party vendors and contractors and suppliers, the potential for supply chain attacks and disruptions has become a top concern for the industry and the ERO. Let's go to the next slide, please. In this session, we'll, we'll explore how a differentiated audit experience, a differentiated approach to audit of the supply chain risk management can help our two fictitious entities effectively manage their unique risks and ensure that we appropriately monitor and gain reasonable assurance of risk mitigation with focus on internal controls and the framework within the framework of the compliance standards. So we will demonstrate how different levels of program maturity can lead to different experiences at audit, both for entities and for WEC. What then is a differentiated audit experience? It means for first, for starters, that your investment in your program makes a difference. Everything you do to increase the likelihood of ongoing compliance and to strengthen the reliability and security of the bulk electric system, all of that makes a difference. This includes your investment in people, processes, and technology. Entities that demonstrate a higher level of commitment to improving their security posture provide assurances which factor into our approach to an audit. Let's look at this in a different way. What is the purpose of a WEC audit? That might seem like an odd question. The purpose of a WEC audit is to see how well an entity is mitigating identified risks. This is really where the differentiation comes in, in two main ways. Next slide, please. First, when different entities have different risks, we can have different approaches and the experiences can be different. When you think about risk-based monitoring audits, your first thought might be focused on what the scope of an audit is or isn't. However, some of the same risk factors that are considered and weighted in determining an audit scope also influence the audit engagement itself in five main areas. One, the risk profile. Registered entities with a higher risk profile might require more intensive audit activities compared to an entity with a stronger compliance program and effective controls. The risk profile of an entity is based on a variety of factors as Scott and Patrick discussed earlier. Two, compliance history. Entities with a history of compliance issues might require more intensive audit activities than entities with a strong compliance record. The CMEP considers the entity's history of non-compliance, including any enforcement actions or penalties that have been issued in the past. Three, size and complexity. The size and complexity of an entity's operations may also be a factor in determining the level of audit activities they receive. Larger and more complex entities may require more resources and attention than smaller and less complex entities. Four, industry trends. WEC also takes into account 
industry-wide trends and emerging risks when determining the level of compliance monitoring and audit activities for a registered entity. For example, an attack trend targeting a specific type of asset or technology might increase compliance monitoring activities for entities that use that asset or technology. Finally, five, regional risk factors. The ERO also considers regional risk factors when determining the level of audit activities for registered entities. For example, an entity operates in an area with a high risk of natural disasters. WEC may include additional audit activities. Phil alluded to this in his presentation on cold weather. One entity might have stronger controls than another. Not every entity has the same program maturity and some entities might have more effective controls than other. It gets a bit tricky now when we talk about audit approach. Let's take SIP 13. Does WEC have one SIP 13 approach for ORCO and another for SunBear? No, SIP 13 is SIP 13, but the ways in which we get to reasonable assurance could well be different for different entities. This is what we hope to demonstrate today in comparing the experiences of our two fictitious entities, Orco and Sunbear. Overall, risk-based CMEP considers a variety of factors when determining the level of compliance monitoring activities for a registered entity and the depth of those activities. By tailoring the compliance monitoring experience to the specific risk profile and compliance history, for each entity, a differentiated audit engagement can provide a more efficient and effective audit experience. So how can WEC prioritize efforts based on the areas of highest risk and used resources in the most effective way possible? From the beginning, the vision of risk-based CMEP has been that the audit experience will be different depending on the risks. One of the dividends of your investment in programs is a differentiated audit experience. Audit, ex scope, audit scopes for different entities might be the same or close to the same. Reasons for this include requirements and stand new requirements and standards and other reasons we have previously mentioned such as compliance history, strength of controls or specific controls that WEC identifies but the audit experience could be different, even if the scopes are the same. Let's talk about the concept now of reasonable assurance. What does that mean? The ERO Enterprise Compliance Monitoring and Enforcement Manual defines reasonable assurance as the degree of satisfaction an auditor must have to support audit conclusions based on evidence gathered during the engagement. Degree of satisfaction is a subjective term that implies professional judgment. What forms can evidence take? Could be a spreadsheet, a screenshot, a report, an interview, a demonstration, a walkthrough, a site visit. All of these are inputs as evidence to reaching reasonable assurance. All types of evidence collectively contribute to an auditor's conclusions. In some cases, the evidence might be on interviews, in other cases, on site tours. An auditor's path to reasonable assurance can be different with different entities based on particular entity characteristics. Here's a key point. If WEC already knows that an entity has a mature and effective supply chain risk management program in place, an auditor may focus on a targeted review of specific areas of the program rather than conducting a full-scale audit. The approach allows the auditor to validate that the program is still effective, identify areas of improvement with recommendations, and even provide outreach, perhaps if there's a future version of the standard soon to be effective. This approach promotes the continuous improvement of risk management and ensures that the program is effective in mitigating risks to the supply chain. Next slide, please, and I will pass to Morgan. Thank you, Phil. 
All right, thank you, Tom. So from the point of view of a compliance program, it makes sense to consider the requirements in the SIP standards holistically. For example, if you want to mitigate procurement risk, consider all related requirements. Let's say you want to assess risk associated with vendors remotely maintaining a system. A good starting point would be to assess risk to supply chain related to the requirements listed on this slide. We'll note a couple additional ones as well. So certainly SIP 13 is a given. Uh, SIP 10 requires conducting regular vulner vulnerability assessments and implementing a configuration change management process. This standard ensures that vulnerabilities are identified and addressed in a timely manner. And that changes to the system are properly controlled. R1.6 specifically addresses risks related to fraudulent software. Not mentioned on the slide, but SIP 4 considers granting vendor access. SIP 5 ensures that ANEs have a clear understanding of who has access to their applicable system networks and implements controls to secure those access points. SIP 5 also addresses risks related to remote access specifically determining and terminating authentic, authenticated vendor initiated remote connections. SIP 11 requires the protections of sensitive information related to the bulk electric system. The standard ensures that sensitive information is not compromised, which could have um, negative impacts on supply chain. Another requirement not listed here is SIP 8, for example, emergency procurements or vendor incidents could trigger a cybersecurity incident for an entity. Again, a holistic approach lends itself well to internal controls where we identify the risks that inform our control objectives, which could well not map neatly to a single requirement, but rather span multiple requirements in different standards. Next. So to reiterate, when it comes to determining the scope of an audit, WEC follows a structured approach that begins by identifying entity risks. This involves conducting a risk assessment to understand the potential threats and vulnerabilities that exist. Once the risks have been identified, the next step is to identify the control objectives. This involves defining specific aims or purposes of the controls that are implemented to address the identified risks. The control objectives are de designed to address risks related to achieving an entity's objective and may take the form of specific requirements or standards that must be met. For example, if the identified risk is unti untimely revocation of access, the control objective might be timely revocation of access. This control objective can then be used to guide the design and implementation of controls that will help mitigate the risk. Again, controls can take many different forms depending on the specific risks and the objectives involved. They may involve automated systems, workflows, or other tools that, that are designed to monitor and manage access to critical systems and data. Once the control objectives had been defined and reasonable assurance necessary controls are implemented, the next step is to identify the scope of our audits. This involves mapping the audit scope to control objectives. So the auditors can assess how well an, entity's, an entity is mitigating the identified risk. Well, how can control objectives influence how auditors approach an audit engagement and make determinations based on reasonable assurance, uh, we'll now see in the comparison of Oracle and SunBear, and then with Tom's key takeaways. I'll pass it over to Terry and Stacia. Thank you, Morgan and Tom. Um, Stacia and I are gonna pick up on what happens at audit for the supply chain requirements. Early on, the audit team will start becoming familiar with the entity the scope and the risks. We become familiar with the entity's compliance program and their history. So we look at past audit engagements, the findings, the AOC's recommendation. Uh, we review any self reports that they've made. Um, we meet with the risk team to confirm the scope of the audit is addressing the risk concerns to the BES. Uh, 
And in this discussion, we dig into what the risk objectives and operational concerns are. We, we want to understand why certain standards and requirements are in scope, because this can help us focus on the controls to mitigate the risks identified. Earlier, the risk team talked about control objectives and risks around um, operational concerns. Control ob objectives, especially the higher risk control objectives, can lead to larger scopes. Strong controls can lead to smaller scopes and a differentiated audit experience. The risk team also talked about the internal controls data collection template, the ICDCT, and the entity is asked to complete this. The ICDCT information is not only used by the risk team, but the auditors refer to it as well because part of the audit, we assess the internal controls that are in place. So the more information the entity provides on controls, the less the audit team will be seeking this information during audit. Um, and it will, the audit will become more of us validating our understanding of what those controls are. So while we're on the topic of internal controls, Strong controls increase the likelihood of future compliance. So controls are important to help our risk team assess risk. During audit, we have discussions around controls, and this is usually included in an interview for a particular standard we are digging into um, as we're digging into the processes. But it can also be a separate interview, especially when an entity has a formal internal controls program. During audit, we have found entities that have controls implemented but they don't necessarily recognize them as controls. We can help entities identify these. Documenting your controls is a great way to improve repeatability and ensure knowledge transfer. In addition to auditors recommending that undocumented controls be documented, we can also recommend controls be implemented to improve the program. These best practices often include preventive, detective, and in some cases, corrective controls to mitigate the risk to the VES. In our formal recommendations, we usually do not prescribe the specific control, but we, um, during the discussions, we share controls that we've seen. We discuss possible controls relative to each entity's environment. So no two entities' processes are exactly the same. Thus, the controls could also differ. Um, the, the last thing I wanna mention about controls during an audit is the more transparent the entity is with the audit team, the better positioned we are to provide the risk engineer's feedback on the controls that are in place. Our assessment of internal controls is shared with the risk in, engineers for their consideration when developing the compliance oversight plan. And we wanna make sure you get credit for those controls that you have implemented. And the last piece of information that entities provide um, excuse me, to, that impacts the audit experience is the quality of the data provided in the RSAs or the aligned work papers as discussed in the first session this morning and the ERT level one and level two evidence. So the RSA is your story, your words of how you comply with this requirement to mitigate the risk to the beds. The ERT evidence request tool level one requests information on your overall compliance policies, programs, procedures, and processes. The details included in the RSAs and the level one documentation represent your, CIP, your CIP program, your SIP program. Often the level one documentation includes controls either denoted in a control section or the controls are incorporated into the process details. If these documents include details of what you do, and how you do it, then we're, we won't need to issue requests for information to get this information. So um, this also holds true for the level two evidence. The ERT level two evidence request is for additional details about compliance for specific cyber assets, personnel, or other individual items that are subject to the standard. This evidence demonstrates you've implemented and followed your pro plans, and it shows what you did and how you did it. So the compliance culture and program, collaboration and sharing controls, and the quality of the compliance evidence are directly correlated to the audit experience. So now let's look at two hypothetical entities and how all of these things impacted the audit experience and the outcome. And then in the next session, the um, enforcement team's gonna pick up where we leave off. So let's go to audit, next please. So I'm Terry Kelly, I am the ATL for um, ORCO the ARCA audit. Um, on this second day of spring, this afternoon, I can finally look out my window and see that it stopped snowing. 
So I really appreciate Phil's discussion on reliability and cold weather. Thank you, Phil. Um, Stacia is gonna be the ATL for SunBear. We're gonna walk you through our audits starting at the beginning. So in this presentation, we're foc focusing on the supply chain standards that the risk team identified to be included in the audit scope. Both entities have the audit scope as they are newly affected, as, as the uh, audit scope is the newly affected supply chain standards. Um, in the presentation, SIP 10-4, requirement 1.6 was inadvertently left off the slide. Um, we'll look at getting that post um, updated in the posted version of the presentation that's online. So the three standards that went into audit was SIP 13-2, requirement 1, SIP 5-7, requirement 2.4, requirement 2.5, and requirement 3, and SIP 10-4, requirement 1.6. So going into audit, we did our research and we found that ORCO historically has demonstrated a strong compliance program. The risk objectives the audit team um, will be dive, diving into are targeted to specific risks and specific processes. And when working with ORCO, our exchanges have been collaborative and transparent. The information the ICDCT provided a list of controls in place and it referenced associated procedures for those controls. The information provided was pertinent, pertinent too, and it addressed the control objectives. The RSAs provided a good picture of the programs for each standard in scope. The level one evidence provided all requested documentation. ORCO also included referenced or linked documents in the evidence, so the auditors did not have to DR for this. The level two data provided all the evidence the auditors needed to support reasonable assurance for their findings. ORCO also provided completed job aids used for implementation, which helped the auditors validate um, that they followed their, that ORCO followed their processes that were documented. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Stacia to talk about the state of things going into the audit with SunBear. Thank you, Terry. Um, as we have heard a few times today, SunBear has a challenged compliance history. And at WEC, we don't know a lot about SunBear's compliance program. They are not fully transparent during monitoring engagements. The risk objectives that the audit team will be reviewing are at the standard or the program level, rather than, the specific, than specific risks or processes. SunBear's communication with WEC is uncommon and minimal, meaning SunBear does not reach out for help or outreach as needed. SunBear did not take full advantage of the ICDCT. ICDCT process. They provided a minimal response, which did not include the evidence files they referenced as supporting documentation. The response overall lacked detail and did not identify controls. SunBear's ARSA included very little information other than listing evidence files. They did not elaborate how they are meeting compliance with the standards in scope. The evidence request tool um, level one was complete. However, the level two response lacked evidence requested. And from that evidence, which we will see on the next slide, led to a more intense audit engagement. Next slide, please. So now we're in full audit mode, and this is where the audit experience changes for the entity based on what we WEC knew about them going into the audit. So even though the supply chain requirements were new and this was the first audit on them, ORCO jumped on the outreach opportunity with WEC to review its supply chain risk management program prior to SIP 13-1's effective date. While this outreach is not an audit of the program, the outreach staff provided feedback which ORCO in turn used to improve its program, making the audit of the program smoother. ORCO provided such good evidence that the auditors only needed to issue one RFI to substantiate reasonable assurance. The interview confirmed our understanding of the evidence, but it was mostly focused on internal controls. Like a normal interview, the audit team started with asking questions, but the interview turned into a conversation with both WEC and ORCO sharing and asking questions. ORCO spoke to the internal controls they had in place. ORCO and the audit team discussed best practices and ideas of potential controls for their environment. ORCO shared their plans to kick off a project to improve controls over the next three years. 
Auditors were able to attain reasonable assurance of the findings and complete their assessment of controls before the scheduled close of the audit and the audit closed three days early. In addition to the audit compliance findings, the audit team shared its observations during audit, its assessment of controls and notes to the engineer um, for consideration when determining future monitoring. And we're gonna talk about this in detail in the next slide. But in this case, the risk team determined SIP 13 would have a lower monitoring priority for ORCO. Stacia? Thank you. Since the auditors have little to no knowledge of SunBear's SIP 13 program or controls, the audit experience was a little bit more complicated and intense. For example, within its supply chain risk management plan, SunBear stated that procurements from a vendor contracted prior to October 1st, 2020 were not applicable. However, while entities are not required to renegotiate existing contracts, procurements through those existing contracts are applicable to SIP 13. The audit team had to issue a request for information to verify if SunBear had procured products or services through these contracts. Ultimately, the audit team was able to verify SunBear did not procure applicable products or services through these contracts, although it was a laborious um, task. There were many instances during the audit engagement where the audit team needed SunBear to clarify its plan and its evidence. Due to the ambiguity of the evidence, the controls assessment required more time and more requests for information. The auditor submitted 10 requests for information and held three interviews just for SIP 13. As it states here, the auditors found one potential non-compliance and four areas of concern and a higher monitoring priority for SIP 13, which we will review on the next slide. Next slide, please. So now we're closing out the audit with the audit compliance findings. ORCO submitted a self-report on SIP 13-2 requirement when after the notice of audit letter was submitted, hence it becomes a potential non-compliance finding during audit. In the next section, session, the enforcement team will talk about processing this open enforcement action. Um, ORCO also received positive observations. Orca went over and above the requirement by including low impact best cyber system procurements in its supply chain risk management plan. The plan also was detailed and documented the internal controls in place. The plan detailed specific types of contracts that were applicable, including contract renewals. During the controls discussion, the auditors asked if Arco had any methods or controls to verify source and integrity of software prior to the software being installed. Discussing the process in more detail, the auditors and ORCO discussed adding a control in the change management process for the change approver to verify the methods were defined prior to authorizing the change to be made. ORCO made a note to include this in their controls project for their internal controls project that they, they will be kicking off soon. Also, during the controls discussion, the auditors asked if ORCO had methods or controls to verify processes are in place to receive notifications by vendors when remote or on-site access should no longer be granted to vendor representatives. Discussing how ORCO handles vendor access in more detail, ORCO, ORCO noted it would be a good idea to add a check in its SIP4 procedures to validate a process was in place prior to granting access to a vendor and this was also given as a formal recommendation. I'm gonna hand it back to Stacia to talk about SunBear's audit compliance findings. Thank you. On this slide, we can see that SunBear was in hibernation, completely sleeping on the new version of SIP 13 that ultimately resulted in a potential non-compliance on SIP 13 R1 for not updating its supply chain risk management plan to include procurements of PACs and ECOMs associated with BES Cyber Systems, pursuant to version two of the standard. Along with the PNC or potential non-compliance, SunBear received four areas of concern and one recommendation. The new, okay, before we get into these areas of concern, I wanna go over the new definition of area of concern, which is, and it was updated in 2021. The new, de the new definition of area of concern 
is defined as a situation that if not addressed, could develop into future non-compliance or risk to the BPS. The definition goes on to state that ineffective or non-existent internal controls may contribute to an area of concern. The current area of concern definition includes internal controls and adds an element of risk. Whereas the old definition focused on situations that would lead to future non-compliances. So this first area of concern that we have is for not describing in its plan how identified risks are assessed and handled. I want to be very clear that Sunbear did briefly address how risks are identified and assessed. Otherwise, that would be a PNC. However, their plan was very ambiguous regarding how risks are assessed and especially how the risks are handled. We commonly ask entities, are your processes or plans repeatable? And in this case, Sunbear had a weakness in this area. It was not repeatable. It was very, very ambiguous. The second area of concern relates to Sunbear not including open source, freeware, and other services procured without an exchange of funds. This goes back to one of the things that we see most within supply chain risk management plans that we audit. Entities, some entities, do not include the definition of procurement within their plans. And we have specifically seen entities not addressing open source and freeware products. Defining key terms such as procurement or vendor can clarify, can clarify applicability and ensure consistent implementation. The third area of concern relates to what we talked about on the previous slide. It is for not including procurements from a vendor contracted prior to October 1st, 2020 within their plan. Again, entities are not required to re renegotiate existing contracts, but procurements through those existing contracts obtained after October 1st, 2020 are applicable to SIF 13. If Sunbear had applicable procurements from those contracts that were not assessed through the supply chain risk management plan, we would have expanded scope to R2 and it would have been a PNC. The fourth area of concern is for only performing risk assessments on resellers, but not on original equipment manufacturers. Now I wanna be clear here that it is not required to perform risk assessments on both resellers and original equipment manufacturers. However, it does create a risk if an entity is excluding one of those groups entirely from their supply chain risk management plan. The recommendation here for Sunbear is to establish an internal controls program to implement detective and preventive controls. This would include controls to prevent and, and detect if SIP 13 if a SIP 13 applicable procurement had not undergone a risk assessment pursuant to the SIP 13 supply chain risk management plan. And with that, next si slide, please. Thanks, Tasha. So auditors share notes with the risk team and these notes include assessment of the compliance culture, training programs, um, subject matter experts, knowledge of processes, documentation, technologies in place, controls in place, what improvements are in the works or being planned, for example, an EMS system, formalizing an internal controls program, changing data centers, plans to grow the business. Um, in this audit, the audit team shared, um, Orco had a comprehensive and a detailed supply chain program. The program included good controls, both preventive and detective, um, to mitigate the procurement risk to the BES. Because of this, the notes to the risk team recommended future monitoring to be a self-certification with evidence for SIP 13-2 requirement two, and requirement two would be put into scope to validate the implementation of the controls. At the time, Orco did not allow vendor remote access or vendor initiated remote connections. So the auditors recommend a check-in to see if anything has changed when determining their future monitoring for SIP 5-7, requirement 2.4, 2.5, and requirement 3. 
Also, when determining future monitoring for SIP 10-4 requirement 1.6, auditor suggested a check-in to verify the controls were implemented to ensure the source and integrity of the software was verified prior to installation. Stacia? Thank you. Um, just to add on what Terry said, since the audit team is, they are the boots on the ground, um, very commonly the virtual ground at times recently, we report back to the risk and control teams what we observe at audit. In Sunbear's case, we observed an overall weak supply chain risk management program and lack of preventive, detective, and corrective controls. We always encourage entities to brag about your programs that we are auditing so we can take as much information back to our risk team to address potential risks that might come up. As you can see here, we are recommending that SIP 13-2 R1 and R2 be in scope for the next audit to see if SunBear has incorporated recommendations or made improvements to the areas of concern that were given during this audit. The other standards related to supply, ch supply chain, SIP 5 and SIP 10 are also included on this slide, even though we did not review them in this presentation. We are recommending that the audit team scope all of R2 at the next audit and scope all of SIP 10 R1 at the ne next audit to assess configuration change management, um, in addition to the verification of software source identity. Now I'll turn it back to Tom for key takeaways. Thank you so much, Stacia, Terry, and Morgan. And I'm gonna bring us home with a couple slides on key takeaways. And we've put in bold, perhaps the key takeaway, the factors we consider to gain reasonable assurance of compliance could change depending on the strength of an entity's controls. We talked about the factors, all the types of evidence we look at, all the ways in which we reach reasonable assurance and all the background work to help us inform our audit approach based on all the things we know or might not know about an entity. And we go, we do a lot of work up front to determine what that scope will be, what the control objectives will be, what risks are we interested in seeing how well an entity mitigates. All of these determine, all of these factors determine the control objectives. Therefore, similarly scoped entities could have different audit experiences depending on their compliance history and their controls maturity. Finally, as Terry and Stacia have emphasized in the notes to the risk team, auditor observations are inputs to the compliance oversight plan. Next slide, please. I want to emphasize that we pay attention to the investments that entities make in developing good programs this can directly affect the approach we take to audit. Entities that have strong compliance history and demonstrate strong controls will afford greater assurances that factor into our approach to them in the future through the compliance oversight plan. On the other hand, if the auditors are unable to glean information on controls, from the submitted evidence, there could be more data requests or requests for information as we are now calling them in Align. There could be more interviews. The experience could be more intense. Finally, before we open it up for questions, I'd like to offer a statement of what the work of audit is, what the work of auditors is, what do we do at audit? Here it is. An auditor obtains reasonable assurance by obtaining sufficient appropriate evidence to evaluate against criteria how well an entity is mitigating risks to the bulk electric system and to draw reasonable conclusions about whether the reliability and security of the bulk electric system are adequately safeguarded. 
Well, thank you. Uh, we have time for questions and are looking forward to that. And we've got a lot of knowledge on the panel here to help you. So Maylee, do we have some questions? We do. Let me go ahead and pull those up. Thank you. Okay. The first one says, will WEC be transparent with entities on the strength of our compliance program? For example, the example indicates ORCO is strong, but some bears challenge. Will entities be provided similar feedback from WEC on where they stand? If so, how will that be provided? Through a compliance oversight plan, during audit, or some other means? I love this question. Thank you so much. Uh, the answer is an emphatic yes. We will provide feedback on uh, our view of the quality of the program. And there are multiple ways in, in which we will do this. It could be at audit. It could be during an interview. It, it, it could be after audit in the form of notes to the risk engineer. Uh, it could find its way and would in this case indeed find its way if we see a high quality program to the compliance oversight plan. It could be at the 90 day post audit follow up. There are a variety of ways in which we could provide this feedback. It could even be before the audit if we see an especially strong response to the ICDCT. Morgan, Tara, Terry, Stacia, anything you'd like to add to that? One thing I would like to add, Tom, is if you are the entity being audited, please speak up and let us know that you want our feedback. Thank you. Yes. Um, we, we can provide it as much or as little as necessary um, if you're open to it. Thank you, Stacia. That was awesome. All right. Next question. What source is WEC using to determine industry trends and region risk factors? This is really a question for Scott and, and, and Patrick. Uh, and I think Holly has jumped in to save me. Is that right, Holly? I think this one is related to um, your speaking uh, at the beginning of the slide deck and when you were referencing- uh, The regional factors. risk factors, yeah. We, yeah. we have a, a, a process that is really outside of, of entity monitoring uh, where uh, we, and it's a, a cross-functional team Many teams at WEC participate in this process to determine uh, regional risk. And we, uh, we apply these regional risks when we're looking at uh, the, the risk for a particular entity. I, I, I hope that answers the question, uh, or, or at least starts to. If not, we can continue the discussion in the HOVA chat, and you can always reach us at sip at WEC.org. Thanks, Holly, for the cue there. Great. We have a question that says, are other entities finding it difficult to purchase non-Chinese electronics? And this question has gotten a number of upvotes. Do you have anything you could add to this conversation? What an interesting question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start and uh, I'm going to pass to the team to continue. There, there's nothing in SIP 13 that, that limits necessarily where or, or, or the country of origin of the vendor. We certainly appreciate your attention to risk here and we applaud that. Uh, this would be a great discussion at forums such as WICIF. Uh, Stacia, Terry, has this ever come up at audit or anything like this or do you have some perspective on this? Um, I was just going to say this would be a great question for WICIF. Since this isn't something that we um, assess in our compliance assessment, um, we haven't received this information. And to my knowledge, no entity has come to us to express their concern about this situation. Um, it's a very interesting question. We just don't have the data to provide an answer. I'd just like to add, um you know, we don't necessarily have the answer, but we do as auditors keep up on industry trends and risks that are out there. Um, we receive a lot of notifications. We have internal meetings and we do in the interviews, we will collaborate with entities and discuss it because part of the audit is us learning as much from the entities as they can learn from us. We all have the same objective. So um, having these discussions help, helps the industry as a whole. 
So we may not have the answer, but we do discuss. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is um, says we cannot get Microsoft to respond after three months of trying. What do we do? This continues. Some vendors want non-disclosure agreements. So what do we do since we cannot share their responses with WEC? What a timely question. This has recently come up. Uh, Terry, Stacia, can you provide some perspective here? Yes, I'll, I'll take the first thing at it and then Terry, you can, you can come in after. Um, okay, in terms of the non-disclosure agreements, we are there to assess if you are implementing your plan. We don't necessarily have to see all of the information the entities are giving you in order to make that assessment. Of course, as auditors, we wanna see as much information as possible that is feeding into your assessment of risks, but we understand that there will be those barriers in place, those non-disclosure agreements, which might make things a little bit more complicated. The only thing that I would tell entities at this point is just make sure that you, um, on your side, you are documenting your assessment and, and identifying of risk as much as possible. Um, I think there was an, oh, Microsoft. Okay, Microsoft is a big player. We see some of these big players that do not wanna play with SIP 13. Do as much research as you can, whether it be public knowledge, any information you can get from Microsoft, just show us that you are doing your due diligence and collecting as much information as you can. And if we have questions, we will have an interview, we will discuss it with you, but we wanna see that you guys are making an effort on your part to assess and identify these risks. Terry, is there anything you wanna add? Um, yeah, just that, you know, we're really looking for the processes that are in place. So the requirement 1.2 processes. So if you're, you're not able to get a response back from the vendor, um, that doesn't mean that you don't have to have a process in place to make sure those um, 1.21 requirements are addressed. So you still need to document what your process is and you may have to have mitigating tasks to ensure that those processes are met. So, you know, maybe a Microsoft phone sign a contract, but you can go out on Microsoft sites, Microsoft site and daily check to see if they have any notifications on um, cybersecurity risks that are out there. So there's, a, there's other ways to have a process without having a specific response from the vendor um, on how to meet that. And there's, there's one more thing that I want to add to build off your response, Terry. Um, when it comes to those 1.2 subparts, those topics that Terry just mentioned, those are not all on the vendor. We can't enforce that they do their part. So we encourage entities to have internal controls to see how they are addressing those subparts as well. Thank you. All right, next question. Do the audit team notes to the risk team also get communicated to the entity? For the example, on ORCO SIP 5-7, do they know the question of changes with remote access will come up? I'll start and Gary and, and Stacia, I'll, I'll give it to you next. Uh, certainly we would be uh, discussing risks we see during the audit engagement or even prior to the audit engagement and during interviews, for example, uh, whether if the question is, would we communicate verbatim to entities what we're communicating to the risk team? Uh, perhaps not, but the content we would be happy to discuss with you. I'd like to emphasize Stacia's great point that we also want to hear from you about how, what, what's the best way in which we can provide feedback to you? You know, kind of a standard question in the workplace we get these days is, what is your preference for communication? What style of communication do you like? Do you like Teams? Do you like email? Do you like phone calls? Well, it's kind of like that with entities. We wanna hear from you about the type of communication you want. And we're, we're happy to be transparent with you with regard to the information we're feeding back to the risk team. Terry, Stacia, would you like to add anything to that? 
Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, during the interviews, we, we really strive to have the conversation so the entity understands and has a good sense of what the risks are, why, why we're having this discussion, where controls can add value. So, you know, if, if the closing of the, of the audit, you see a slide with, you know, your findings, we go way beyond that in the interviews and we, we really do strive to make sure that the entity fully understands what those words on the slide mean. And, you know, it's not uncommon that we'll send an email. We may say, add, add you know, add some checks to your testing of your packs. And then out of band, we'll send them an email of 20 things that are commonly checked, you know, to, for consideration in their physical security program. So we really do want to make sure that we dig deep but um, you know that all of that doesn't end up on the audit finding report. But we want to make sure the entity has that information, to, so we're getting some value out of the discussion. Terry, that is such a great point. Thank you. That I'd like to emphasize: there should never be any ambiguity uh, at closing what any of the findings mean. Uh, we review all the findings the day prior to the closing. Uh, it should be clear to you what, what they mean. If you're not clear, please ask. Uh, what's the point of, especially for areas of concern and recommendations, uh, what's the point of those if you're not clear on them? And we really want to have those discussions with you. And we're, we're even uh, open to beginning dis, uh, discussions from an enforcement perspective. We are not enforcement, but we can speak to what's next and we can speak to what you are likely to do next in terms of extent of condition and root cause analysis. We can help you understand these processes. So it, it, we're not just throwing, over the, throwing it over the fence to enforcement. We're helping you make a smooth transition and we would want to be transparent with you. Stacia, anything to add on this question? Yeah, I think I might um, be repeating a lot of what was stated, but one thing that I tell entities when I'm leading the audit, leading their audit is do not hesitate to reach out to us. We are always happy to help. We are always happy to talk you through anything you don't understand. When it comes to those notes to the risk engineers, I don't think that it would be a lot of, it, it wouldn't be a surprise to entities based on the conversations we had during the audit, during the interview, as Terry said. Um, one thing that we really, really strive for is partnership over policing. <laughs> we want to add value, not we don't we I mean, we want to assess compliance, but beyond that, we want to add value to your program as well. I love that station partnership over policing. Hey, next question. Is WEC saying that if the entity provides comprehensive responses and evidence during the ICDCT review process, this will reduce data requests, RFIs, and interviews during audit. I was waiting for that question. Thank you so much. The answer is yes. And let me explain a little bit and then I'll uh, welcome feedback from the team. Uh, a strong ICDCT response can definitely influence the approach we take to audit in a number of ways. It could possibly even reduce scope. That is by no means a given, uh, but there, that possibility is there. So we don't wanna create that expectation. On the other hand, if we see an especially strong response, a response that includes implementation evidence, that's the key, then we may actually find reason not to uh, do much, if anything, with that requirement during the audit engagement itself. It can influence the depth of what we do at audit. It can influence the approach we take. Uh, an entity that has an especially strong program in a certain area, we may take a completely different approach at audit where we're focusing on your future program. Say there's a, a, a version of the standard that's going to be effective in, in a year and you'd like to have a conversation with us about, hey, uh, are, are we thinking the right way about this new version? Would you, would you be willing to look at the new plan we've written? Of course we would. That's the reason we're here is to help you uh, remain compliant. So 
it could definitely influence a strong ICDCT response. And Terry alluded to this earlier. This also applies to the ERT. If we get an, an especially strong thorough response to the ERT, especially the uh, level two with the implementation that could definitely influence the approach we take and could really streamline the experience at audit. I love this question because that's really the, the essence of what we're trying to communicate here. It could indeed result in fewer RFIs, fewer interviews. And we have seen this trend emerge as we've used the ERT and the ICDCT in their current forms. Terry, Stacia? I'll just add that you want to see the audit team get fired up. We'd much rather <laughs> talk about improving the reliability of the bulk electric system, discussing risks and controls, as opposed to discussing pieces of evidence to um, assess compliance. So, thanks, Terry. Yeah, I'll I'll add that I know it can be hard for entities to see the value when they're not seeing the value that their ICDCT is bringing to the audit team but it is extremely helpful. The auditors review it, they get familiar with it. We're able to see a more um, holistic picture of your program, which most of the time equates to fewer in requests for information. Thanks, Stacia. Well, and the ERT level too. I yep. mean, we, we just mentioned this morning, I mean, the, it, there, we've seen incidences where the, um, the data was so solid that we had everything we needed to assess compliance that for the past, during the audit period, the, the entity was compliant. Uh, we, we went straight to the risk discussions and controls. All we had to do was validate what we were seeing and it audit was over. Like, audit, mm -hmm. audit for the compliance perspective of that was over. Uh -huh. Very nice, Terry. Um, Sorry, just one more response. I know in that question it stated interviews. Now, I want entities to embrace interviews because a lot of the times those are when we are giving feedback and we're discussing best practices and how you can improve. And the entity is giving us a lot of risk information, well, a lot of information that can we can use to address risks that have been identified. So interviews are an extremely helpful tool. Perfect. Okay, I've been asked to direct this question to Morgan. Are there guidelines from WEC for acquiring firmware or software for equipment that is no longer supported by the manufacturer or developer? Um, guidelines, I can't think of a specific guideline that provides this. Um, there is, um, I'm thinking if there's a practice guide that DERO Enterprise has been working on, but um, no, I don't have a specific guideline that's endorsed by the ERO enterprise about end of life software. I can say that um, we do have a couple of things that we mentioned to entities and consider when we see end of life software in their environments and uh, they have a plan and a path forward, but um, not, not specifically ERO endorsed um, guidance. I would just add that uh, working with legacy equipment so you can no longer patch, for example, this is a great use case for defense in depth, layered controls, additional detective controls. Um, so just wanted to add that, thank you. All right. Uh, will the auditors require assets for SIP 13 that need to be listed with SIP 2 and SIP 5 assets? Terry, Stacia, Maley, could you repeat that question? Sure. I this will probably be our last question of this session. We're running close to our time, but yep. it says, will the auditors require assets for SIP 13 that need to be listed with SIP 2 and SIP 5 assets? I, I'll, take, I'll take a shot at that if you, or if you want to, Stacia. No, go ahead, Terry. Okay, so um, when they're talking about assets, I'm assuming they're talking about bulk electric system assets. So like our facilities, our substations. So we kind of have a tiered approach when we look at SIP 13, we look at the, we look at the assets and we really focus in on the best cyber systems and the cyber assets within there. Um, we will cross reference at times to see if there's a new asset that has been added after the applicability of SIP 13 and verify that against the procurements in the SIP 13 plan. 
I'm not sure if I addressed the question, but I, I, I'm thinking that's what they were getting at. You okay. could pick it up in the chat too further if you'd like. Yes, thank you. Sure, yeah. Thank you so much, Tom, Terry, Stacia, and Morgan. This has been an excellent session. Our next session will begin at 3.30 Mountain Daylight Time. The enforcement, the comparative enforcement experience is a pre-recorded session. Go ahead and open that session in Whova and click play to access that video. We will have a live Q&A following that video recording at 4.15 Mountain Daylight Time. Thank you so much.